Dear friend, I'm writing to you from Benares, the Jerusalem of Hinduism, a great holy city on the Ganges River that is as ancient as Thebes or Babylon. It has been two months since I left Montreal, two months of traveling through the south of India, two months of asking myself questions about who I really am, who lies behind these thoughts, emotions, and sensations. I am intrigued by the sadhus, the ascetics who renounce material possessions and wander through India's holy places. I would like to get to know them and to learn the discipline of spiritual development called sadhana. I know that path will not be an easy one to follow. And I am hesitating before taking the first step. But let me explain to you how I made this choice. I decided to go see Betty Griffith, a Benedictine monk who is the head of a Hindu Christian community where they are exploring the unity of Eastern and Western religions. The Shantivanam Ashram is a kind of bridge between the words of Christ and the ancient wisdom of Veda. It was founded 30 years ago by two French Benedictines, Jules Monchenin and Henri Le Sceau. Perhaps this unique synthesis of East and West will lead the way to our common future. At 80 years old, Betty Griffith has been living in India for half a century. He is a man of great warmth and humility. For me, he was a valuable introduction to India and the spirit of Hinduism. We try to rethink our Christian faith in the context of Indian philosophy, Vedanta particularly. You see, Vedanta is one of the great philosophical systems of the world, one of the three or four greatest. And our Catholic theology is based on the divine revelation in the Bible, uh, interpreted in light of Plato and Aristotle, you see, and then of modern uh, European philosophers. And that's good as far as it goes, but it's very Western. And we have this immense treasury of Oriental wisdom in Vedanta and also in Mahayana Buddhism. And we feel the call of the Church today is to express Christian mystery, not simply in the language of Greek philosophy, but the language of Vedanta and Mahayana Buddhism. And that is taking place now, slowly, we're discovering how to to use these terms of Satchit Ananda, you see, the name for the Godhead, or this term Purusha, the cosmic person, which applies wonderfully to Christ. And then the term Shakti, you see, the divine energy through there. All these different terms can be used to bring, you know, you express the Christian faith in a new language and you get new insights into it. <laughs> posture, and gestures were all of India, yet they made me think of the early Christian church, 
Betty Griffith agreed there were similarities, but also a major difference. I think the great difference is this. We have a great mystical tradition in the West, right from Origen and Gregory of Nyssa and Dionysus the Areopagite to St. Therese and John of the Cross and so on. But um, it tends to be a supernatural way of prayer. The natural basis is not there. And people today need this natural basis. And in the India, the first thing you have to learn to do is to sit. And if you can learn to sit properly for an hour, you're well on the way to meditation, you see. To sit in harmony of the body and of the breath and not moving. Then your mind becomes, your body controls the mind, you see. And as the body comes under control, so all this restlessness, this movement of the mind begins to cease. The great obstacle is the mind. And the first sutra of yoga, sutras of Patanjali, the great classical system of yoga, is yoga is chitta vritti niroda, cessation of the movements of the mind, how to stop the mind. And Western people have been educated to activate their mind from childhood, and they can't stop it any longer. And so you have to find a method of stopping the mind. And Vipassana, Zen, yoga, they're all different methods of, of bringing the mind to its back to its center. And so we practice a method of sitting, breathing, and repeating a mantra, repeating the words, till your mind becomes still and you become open to the presence of God. I call it the practice of the presence of God, to become aware of the presence. It's always there, but you're so active in your mind and your thoughts and your feelings, you're not aware of it. When they begin to subside, become still and quiet, then you become aware of the presence. And to live in the presence, you see, that is the aim of life, really. <laughs> for a Christian and for a Westerner because all distinctions disappear between God and you and you and the world. Everything dissolves, in a sense, into the one. But it's not, as people imagine, it's not simply a losing all reality and entering into a sort of vague mist. It's a, a profound experience of going beyond the dualities and discovering the total reality in the beyond, you see. Everything that is here is there, they say, and all that is there is here. How to see behind all the phenomena of this world, behind our body and our mind and our thoughts, to the one reality which is everywhere in everything and in everybody. I was surprised to hear a Christian monk directing me toward the Hindu path to the divine. Betty Griffith told me the story of Ramana Maharshi. His contemporaries saw him as a Jivan Mukta, a liberated spirit who became fully conscious of the presence of the eternal within. It was a dramatic experience. He was a young man in Madura in the end of last century and quite healthy and normal, a Brahmin boy, normally devout, not nothing special. And one day he had a feeling that he was going to die and it was so strong that he sort of surrendered to it. And he lay down in the room where he was near the temple in Madura and surrendered himself to death. He let the body become stiff, he stopped breathing, and he said to himself, now this body is dead, am I dead? And at that moment, he underwent a mystical death. He realized, I am not this body, I am an eternal spirit. And he never for a moment lost that awareness. I am, they would say, the eternal spirit, the Atman, you see, and this body is not me. And that is the authentic Hindu Advaitic experience, you see. 
and it was so profound that he couldn't stay any longer in his family. He left for Iron Natural, his holy hill at Tiruvannamalai, and lived in a cave there for many years. Eventually they built an ashram at the bottom of the hill and people began to come from all over the world. And they went to sit in his presence, you see. Many would come with all kinds of problems and questions. And after half an hour or an hour in his presence, it seemed all their questions had been answered. There was this presence of the spirit in him was so, uh, you know, dynamic and, and so powerful that people were simply overwhelmed by it. And this is what we seek, you see, th this is the I, and his, his one teaching to ask everybody to ask themselves, who am I? Am I this body? Am I still more these thoughts, feelings, desires, this personality, which I think is me? Or is there something beyond that? Hearing these words, I was determined to go to the holy mountain of Arunachala to visit the cave where Ramana Maharshi had lived in seclusion for seven years. At the foot of the mountain is a huge temple in honor of Shiva, the god of reincarnation, of life, death, and the fusion of all beings in the Absolute. Arunachala. In Hindu mythology, it is considered to be the center of the world. How can I describe the intensity of what I experienced inside Ramana Maharshi's cave? I felt as if an immense power was about to reveal itself to me in its fullness and that I would be dissolved in it. understand the disturbing force inside myself? How could I cross the barrier that separated me from it? I felt I had so much to learn. So I went in search of a Hindu spiritual guide.
Although India has many gurus, it has few genuine masters. Swami Premananda is one of them. He was accompanied by his interpreter and main disciple, Swami Durgananda. It's a religious tradition that in, in this country, that when you go and see a sadhu or a monk, that you bring an offering and you bring a garland. My question was simple. How do I find the road to self-knowledge and liberation? To look for this freedom, to look for this truth within your mind, Initially, what you require within you is self-confidence, belief in yourself. If you do not have belief in yourself, you cannot look for the truth, you cannot find the truth. Sometimes when you meet people like this, there might be people who might cheat you. Sometimes you might even go on the wrong path. So for both these things, you can't blame anyone else. Finally, the person who is responsible for yourself is your own self. You have to find fault with your own self for it. Why I told you that you might go on the wrong path is because when you are lacking in self-confidence, it's a good chance that people might go on the wrong path. So when that happens, when you go and meet a sadhu or when you go and meet somebody, if he starts cheating you, then you're bound to go on the wrong path. If you have self-confidence in you, you will not go on the wrong path. And each one will have truth and untruth. So if you have confidence in you, you will be able to siphon out the truth from this person and discard the untruth in him. If you try to bring the environment, the tradition which is in your country to this country, then you will uh, induce or bring that culture here and then destroy the culture here. And this religious culture here will be destroyed and you will also go on the wrong path and not know the truth. When you come here, you must try to adapt the tradition, the cultural patterns, the ways of behavior as according to this country. Then only you can, you are, you are able to search for this truth within you properly. For that, which is most important to you, is patience. And second thing what you require is very strong belief in yourself. Before you die, somehow try to understand this and find this. It was as if he was asking me to give up my old life and take up another. This, dear friend, is the course I've decided to take. I am ready to embark on a new stage in my spiritual journey. He's a sadhu, 
an ascetic who wanders from holy place to holy place. He bears the name of Shiva in his most combative form, Bhairav the Terrible. He agrees to let me travel with him if I promise to follow his instructions, to change into Hindu dress, to bring him the container that holds the ashes he rubs on his body, and, as a mark of respect, to place his sandals at his feet. By performing these tasks, I will be accepted as an apprentice in the world of ascetics. He tells me about the Kumbh Mela, a great religious festival that occurs every 12 years and draws thousands of ascetics and millions of pilgrims from all over India. Swami Premananda's words come back to me. There might be people who will try to cheat you. Sometime you might go down the wrong path. But for both these things you can't blame anyone else. You were the one who was responsible for your own self. Bhairav is not a guru, but a sadhu, a seeker from a Shaivite sect called Udasan, which means detachment. He was initiated by a master and since childhood has followed rigorous ascetic practices, including yoga of the body and mind called sadhana. We stop on the steps of a small temple dedicated to Shiva, where we will spend the night. Like many Westerners, I have long been interested in the Eastern practice of meditation. I ask Bhairav about it. It's not the word meditation which comes first. First comes the way how one sits, how one talks, how one walks eats and sleep. The way of gesture is important. You know, instead of uh, standing and uh, saying hello and shaking your ass, as we see in the Western society, okay? Mm -hmm. No, we say here very politely, you know, the whole, the suppleness of the body, what I say. The body have to be supple. The body have to be in a, in a proper discipline that you can dissolve yourself 
in a diameter of 6 inches or 12 inches also you can push yourself and to make that kind of body suppleness one have to do the certain gestures certain positions and asanas which i am saying you that okay and these things are difficult in the uh, in the west because they are not used to it they sit on the chair they don't sit on the ground and every gesture have its own meaning the, of the kundalini awaken which patanjali have already proved it yeah. until you reach the haridwar you will learn a lot like this slowly slowly but you have to be impatient this is the whole idea in the culture We've been traveling together for several days now, and I'm a bit confused. I thought I was going to learn how to meditate, but instead I find myself doing laundry in the river. Having finished his ablutions, Bhairav is putting ashes over his body. These rituals seem so important to him, but to me they are still a mystery. patience he keeps telling me patience it is by learning to put your heart into these most humble actions that you will be prepared for the kumbha mela for your initiation in our great mother ganga patience you still have a lot left to learn and perhaps even more to unlearn Now, when we put the ash on our body, it's like putting the clothes on our body. Because the ash is the mother, the ash is the father, the ash is the creator, the, the ash is the destructor. And not only this, ash represents the Shiva himself. And when I speak Shiva, I mean to say Shiva is the god of destruction. Shiva is a god of preservation Shiva is a god of creation and he puts ash also on him because Shiva also represent himself as staying in the cremation ground he is mahayogi he is called mahayogi the title is given to him mahayogi because of his way of detachment and attachment to the same time attachment with the supreme spirit a detachment with the society ash purify the heart the soul the mind the intellectual intellectuality of the personality so we all sadhu society we put ash you know and also it's like an air condition i would say when you put the ash in the winter season the the skin is covered with the ash so the the, the wind doesn't enter it you don't feel the cold when you put in a hot season the ash becomes wet by the sweating and it gives you the uh, the air condition you become cool yourself you know I'm becoming familiar with the life of the ascetic. It is a life that demands the renunciation of comfort and the acceptance of the constant guidance of a master. It is a difficult path for us westerners, 
who have made comfort a god and have so much trouble accepting masters. Bhairav has taught me the rhythm of pilgrimage, walk, stop, and then off again without looking back. Along the way, he shows me a land that is filled with holy cities and sacred places. And one of the holiest cities, Hardvar, lies at the foot of this mountain. Here, the largest and most spectacular of all the Indian religious festivals will take place, the Kumbha Mela. More than 80 million pilgrims will come to celebrate during the 40 days of the Kumbha Mela. Legend has it that here, where the Ganges swells into a basin called the Brahma Kund, a drop of Amrit, the nectar of immortality, fell from the heavens and gave extraordinary spiritual power to the waters. This year's festival has a special significance because it coincides with the passing of Halley's Comet, a symbol of the celestial origins of the River Ganga. For these people, Bathing in these waters is like bathing in the heavens. Don't try to understand the Kumbha Mela, Bhairav tells me. Let it carry you along. Don't stand back. Become part of it. I'm 
Before bathing in the sacred basin, you must first purify yourself in the Ganges. I'm beginning to understand that Bhairav's prayer is not a request. He dissolves into the natural world. It is as if to experience the absolute, you must realize the underlying reality of the simplest elements, fire, ash, and water. But when I see him acting like this, I'm still a little taken aback. feel ridiculous. I'd like to be able to imitate Bhairav, but I can't remember his movements. And no matter how holy this water may be, it's freezing. I feel lost. I can no longer make sense of what is happening to me. This strange land, the crowds, and this sadhu always watching me. But it is a good thing that he is here. Without him, I would be completely cut adrift. For thousands of years, India has given the Brahmin caste the responsibility of guarding its sacred rituals. On my forehead, the priest draws a red dot surrounded with yellow, which symbolizes the Ganges. The mark shows that I have followed the rules. 
But I never felt so far from home. And this sadhu beside me, I can't help wondering if he is just playing with me like a cat with a mouse. We are approaching the climax of the festival. Different sects of ascetics from all over India are moving toward the basin. For the pilgrims, it is a rare opportunity to get close to these holy men. Shunning all possessions, even clothing, they are the guardians of the purest tradition. They emerge from the solitude of their caves only for special events like the Kumbha Mela. For the first time in more than 200 years, Halley's Comet will line up with Jupiter, Venus, the Sun and the Moon to produce a great concentration of energy which will strike the sacred basin and magnify its spiritual powers. happens, the Nagas throw themselves into the water to intercept the cosmic energy. Through them, this energy will be made available to the pilgrims and the other sadhus. Now that the Nagas have given the sign, the people rush to take their turn. The anarchy of the moment is fused together in a single, powerful vibration. Just as their ancestors have for centuries past, they have come here to pray, to return to the source of all life, to be reborn at the breast of Mother Ganga. As they perform the same rites as their ancestors, time disappears and the generations are joined together in the waters. Bhairav leads me to the heart of the festival.
His eyes light up. He is euphoric. His whole being seems to have captured something which I cannot quite grasp. I still don't know the exact movements, but it no longer matters. My fears have left me. I let myself be carried away by the joy overflowing from a million hearts joined as one. We all are involved in one soul. It doesn't matter human being. In human being, if it's gender, masculine or female. <laughs> yeah. Bhairav pokes fun at my innocence. But at the same time, he is proud of how far we've come together. We've become companions, united by this unique experience. In putting the ashes on me, he confirms that I have crossed a great barrier. The ashes tell me, you are here and now. There is no before, there is no after. There is nowhere else, here and now. Let go, surrender to the crowd, celebrate. This is eternity. While the celebration continues under the bright light of the full moon, Bhairav leads me away. We celebrate with other sadhus. I let myself dissolve into this magical night. I feel like this haunting music is drawing me out of my body. Thank <laughs> you.
feel like an old soul waking up after a long night across the span of time. The inner light has faded. The magic circle of sadhus has vanished. Bhairav has given me a glimpse of the other side. Now it's time to move on, to part. This is how it should be. Keep moving with the river. Listen to its voice. Let yourself be guided to the source and find peace, he tells me. Okay. <laughs> I continue on alone. Bhairav and Kumbha Mela are behind me. Ahead, the source of the Ganges. I feel like a cup of tea, a good cup of chai. I no longer feel like a stranger here. I'm comfortable with these people. In my head, though, things are not so simple. I want to understand the experience I had with Bhairav and the dream, the vision. What was it? I would very much like to relive that experience of unity with the world around me. The villagers tell me about a sage who lives in a valley a little north of here, the Valley of the Gods. His name is Shyam. It means blue space. When I met him, I felt that I could trust him. So I tell him about my search. with which I know that I exist, it is self. 
the very knowledge with which I know that I am seeing all this world, it is self. But the question is now where that self is to be found. As milk has got the light in it, butter in it, but unless you churn it, the butter will not come and light will not come. Therefore, one has to churn, and churning is experience, as you have said, on experiencing from the west to the east, came to India and reached Kumbh Mela. And you have seen varieties of the forms in Kumbh Mela, but you have experienced them. Forms were outside, but without you, the experiencer, the self, all those forms were nil, were non existent. So, who is the self? You are the self, but you are the self not in the form of nails or fingers, because nails can be cut, fingers can be cut, arms can be cut, heart even fails, brain fails, but they can be revived if self is introduced in them. So self is at the back of everything. The world may change, but self lives. Self is the life. So self is the basis of all the forms. But for a man, in order to know the self, he has to use the knowledge part, the experience part. A man who does not experience the forms, does not experience the things, he will not know that experiencer is there. Now if experiencer you withdraw and things remain there, then self is not found. So self is the basis of all the experiences and the forms in terms of knower, knowingness. That knowingness, is the self, that is your true nature. And all this form which is seen is the object in relation with the subject, the mind. So subject and object are in relation because of the link of the self. So self is that spirit in the form of knowingness that knows all that there is, is me. That is the infinite nature of that self. And self can be known just by mind, stilling the mind. You have to still the mind. If you do not still the mind, you are in the varieties of the forms. And if you still the mind, then you are with one form. And that can be known very easily if one closes the eyes and watches the space within. That space is unchanging. I want to tell you practically, showing this gorge over here on the Himalayas, how big rock this is. It was all one mountain at one time. But when water began to flow, how soft water is and how small channel is. But when it began to flow and constantly it began to flow, now the result is that there is a big gorge. And this a huge mountain, like a steel-like mountain, is cut into pieces and it made the channel and got the result and it will go now to the ocean and will get the result of its vastness and the power of the ocean but little water and then will know how vast it is in the same way the individual consciousness when you meditate on this level and practice daily constantly it will happen the individual consciousness will become the ocean of the vast consciousness and then you will know how big and vast your power is and your might is. Otherwise, these individual drops are coming down from that hill and they think they are individual and small. But when they go to the source, they know they are one with the water. In the same way, the individual consciousness by constant practice will come to know there is a vast ocean of God consciousness, self-consciousness and the whole consciousness and you will become on that day perfect and will know that it is the perfect consciousness you were vast and infinite already. That will the practice and constancy will do. Constancy, repetition, that is essential. Repetition, constancy, repetition, daily, day and night, whatever time you get. But constancy should be maintained.
To take advantage of the relationship, you must surrender to it. The master isn't a tyrant who imposes his will on you. He helps you overcome obstacles and to pass on to the next stage. Swami Shyam's teachings are reflected in his actions. Speaking, walking, bathing, even breathing. The simplest of his gestures are meditation. I sense that he is at one with nature, with life, with himself. He is the living answer to my questions. I am going to get you into the investigation an experiment within your own self. Up to this time, you were seeing the things. So your eyes were seeing external things, but now eyes are closed. Your thought will come and go, it will change. At that time, your mind will be distracted. You will go to your restaurant, to your family members, to the ocean waves, to the Kumbh Mela. And all the Mahatmas and Sadhus and traders and marketeers and Yatris and pilgrimage you will see. Don't mind because this is the work of the mind. But there is one super mind who is super conscious and is staying always as a witness self who does not change and sees that all this drama is going on. So main Instruction in this investigation, Marcel, from my side, is that don't mind your thoughts. Treat them as Kumbhavela Yatris, and you are taking a bath 
and they are moving and coming. Treat the thoughts as your children who are playing in your courtyard, coming and going, and let them play. They will be just stopping by themselves to just walk. So here at this time, you are watching. You are seer. You are knower. I want you to pay attention on this knower. That is your I. That is eternal. That never changes. You watch the breath. The breather is there. But the knowledge of the breath, you have the real self. Until you reach that source of your immortality and know that I am immortal, till then you will be uneasy, you will be suffering, you will be worried. But when you reach the source, source will tell you its nature of joy, delight, perfection, immortality, permanent existence and permanent knowledge and permanent place and the vastness like the pure sky and for that you remain just quiet one minute and watch this place. The knower of these space, the knowledge of these space and the space is one reality that's called pure consciousness. That is your true nature. My information was this and technique is very simple. You close the eyes and remember the word which is the name of the souls. I am immortal. I am blissful. I call it Sanskrit Amaram Ham Madhuram Ham Amaram Ham Madhuram Ham Ganga, that reaching the source, you will know that you have to keep flowing constantly and help the whole humanity and purify them and fill their hearts with purity, joy and love and affection. And this we have to do daily, constantly, constantly. Repetition makes you perfect. Constancy makes you perfect. But you have to do it. This is it. You have to open the eyes, rub your palms, cup your eyes and feel easy. Time, you will always know that it is three or four minutes. You are charged with energy and now you work throughout the day. Is that so simple? It is simple at this time, but when you practice, you will find it that going towards the source, you have to keep on marching. And then you'll find it is not so simple, but you have to do it. Technique is simple, but continuity is to be maintained. That is difficult. So you have to march on. Marcel, wait a minute and watch this river. Would you like to sit down here? Yes. You see, this river is flowing down the hill. It will continue very easily. But if this river is asked to go upward, how difficult would it be? Because the upward is a height. Down below, 
it is very easy for it to go towards the plane because it is low. In the same way, human consciousness flows downward very easily towards his body, towards the taste of the senses and objects, very easily. And it keeps flowing and flowing, even the rocks it can cut and can flow, but then it's still it is sense of duality, sense of otherness, sense of forgetfulness, because it cannot know what is the source unless it reaches the source. Therefore, a human consciousness has to be very, very powerful. And on the level of this information, I already told you that you have the power because you came from the source, river came from the source. I have to remind this river, I have to remind this life that you have the power to go and reach the source. But don't stop. It is very hard. You have to do it by yourself. Information you can get by my, from myself and from any other persons. But this work you have to do by yourself, how to reach the source, that self, which is all within you. But you have to dig it, find out, and thus I say, you just move on, but knowing that you can do it. You have the power. You have to use the power. Don't think that you are weak and you cannot do it. So just move. Thank you very much. Nice. I know now that a strong will and self-confidence are necessary when traveling this path. They have allowed me to take each step, and each step in turn has shown me the next. As for the work, the work on myself, it continues with every new step and every new experience. The journey inward, the way to become liberated from all that binds us and to know the self. Bas tere shi 
ਸਿੰਘੋਂ ਸੇ ਪਾਇਆ